It is indeed a proud privilege and honor to have in our midst the illustrious, dynamic, and versatile Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Dr. Tharoor is an award-winning author, a politician, former UN envoy, and human rights activist. His impeccable blend of wit, charm, and elegance makes him a globally recognized speaker. The sesquicentennial batch has the singular honor of having Dr. Shashi Tharoor to address them in his valedictory address. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and welcome on stage Dr. Shashi Tharoor. The most reverend Dr. G. Daiva Shirvadam. Daiva Shirvadam must be the most appropriate name for a church leader I've ever come across. Professor John K. Zachariah, principal of Bishop Cotton School. Shiva Grover, the outstandingly impressive young outgoing captain of the school. Retiring staff. The very many distinguished guests here, too many to name. Teachers, dear students, the 551 of you, I've already tweeted a picture of some of you uh, at this ceremony before the light turned too dark. Prize winners today, parents, alumni of the school, ladies and gentlemen, friends. I hope that covers everybody. I know it's customary to say what a pleasure it is to be at any of occasion one is to address, but it really is a pleasure uh, to be at this incredibly impressive, splendid graduation ceremony on the sesquicentennial of this wonderful school. And I do want to thank Principal Zacharias for his extremely generous introduction of me a few minutes ago. It was the kind of praise that my late father would have been proud of, but only my mother would have believed. And it was delivered in the most splendid voice I have ever been introduced in, as I'm sure the students here testify, having no doubt heard it in many, in many other circumstances. I hope always pleasant ones, but one can never be sure with principles. I think to be told off in that voice must be the most terrifying experience any student has ever had. So it's a great incentive for good behavior. I uh, also want to say that um, it really is a pleasure to be here. It's, it's easily one of the most impressive ceremonies I have ever addressed. And believe me, I've had to address quite a few in my time. And this historic occasion, uh, marked by this graduating class of 551 boys, reminds me that the year 1865 was actually a pretty significant year in world history and Indian history. The end of the US Civil War was that year. The 13th Amendment to the American Constitution that abolished slavery was ratified that year. Lala Lajpat Rai, the great nationalist hero, was born that year. A census was conducted for the first time in the northwest provinces of India. And of course, your school was founded. Your school now ranked amongst the 100 best educational institutions in Asia. Uh, was, was founded by the Reverend Samuel Taylor Pettigrew, obviously a very far-sighted clergyman from Cambridge University, and also a very modest one, since otherwise your school would be called Pettigrews and not Cottons. But there you are. He named it for whoever inspired him, the bishop. And of course, the name has now gained glory uh, over the, for 150 years, the illustrious list of alumni over a 14-acre campus. And I gather that your 6,000 schools, I was looking at the incoming school captain and thinking, my word, he is going to take over leadership of 6,000. That's not a small responsibility. 
and of course uh, the 500 members of faculty, which is a very, very good proportion in any school. And I, in reading about your school, was also struck by the fact that the school takes care of something like a thousand out of these 6,000 economically challenged students, um, including in other educational institutions, uh, providing scholarships and midday meals and uniforms and school books and so on. And I think this is a very welcome reminder that in an institution like this, one must always be conscious of one's responsibility beyond the walls of this prestigious institution. And I, I congratulate the school for the spirit it has shown here. Now, I've come from the world of politics, where, as you know, we are governed today by those who incline towards the right. And for the last 10 years, we've governed by many who tend to incline towards the left. So I'm very pleased that for 150 years, the school has managed to not stray from its moral compass and has stuck to neck dextrosum, neck sinistrosum, hmm? neither to the right nor to the left. Now, the center is where I usually find myself in our politics, so I was particularly happy to hear your slogan. The only problem, of course, is it's all very well to be middle of the road, but in India, if you're in the middle of the road, that's when you get run over by traffic in both directions. So I'm glad that Bishop Cottons has been slightly more fortunate than I have been. But let me do some of the formalities one must do on an occasion like this and start off by congratulating the prize winners whose talents and efforts were recognized today and to whom I was able to hand over the very impressive trophies that the school has been giving over the years, the rolling trophy, as well as the ones they can take home. And I know that looking at the quality of the school, that there must have been many others who didn't actually come onto the stage who have also done remarkably well. And I think that uh, while we appreciate the tremendous accomplishments of the ones who were recognized, one must also spare a thought for the ones who nearly made it and for one reason or the other ended up in second place. I want to tell you that I've had my share of first prize finishes, particularly throughout school and college. But in one of the big challenges of my life, the contest for the post of Secretary General, I was one of those who came second. I was the, the one who came second, two votes short of the victor in the first ballot. And uh, it's always struck me that uh, Groucho Marx's famous line, you know, when he said, close but no cigar, was particularly heartless. I don't smoke cigars as it happens. But the fact is that the cigar only goes to the one who comes first, not the one who came close. But there is no disgrace in coming close because it means you tried. It is a failure to try, the failure to make the attempt that I think is far, far, far more to be criticized or even pitied than the ones who did their best, didn't walk away with the cup, but know they did the best they can. And I'm going to come back to that theme. And I, I wanted to mention it right on because school prize givings can be very cruel affairs for those who don't get the prizes. But it's important for us to remember that they include a lot of people who pipped others to the post who might, in a different set of circumstances, been also deserving. But I have no doubt, I have tremendous faith in the quality of the school and the discernment of the principal to choose wisely the right winners, and I'm sure that the winners deserve our thunderous applause, which I invite you to collectively give them right now. At the same time, I'm very conscious that uh, the qualities that are awarded on stage are not the only qualities that make good citizens of India and therefore distinguished and proud alumni of the school. Because a school produces good students, but ultimately it has a great responsibility 
to produce good human beings. And I would hope that having seen the atmosphere of discipline, of values, of adherence to certain standards that characterized every aspect of this ceremony and this evening so far, that the school does indeed recognize and value the importance of producing good human beings. In school, we don't only learn in the classroom. We also learn on the playground. We learn on the way to and from school. We learn how to engage with other students, with our seniors and our peers. We learn how to engage with our teachers with the right combination of respect and challenge that is so important. And I say challenge advisedly because a good teacher always likes to be challenged. If the best student is always the one who regurgitates what the teacher has said, it seems to me the teacher has not done a good enough job of igniting the curiosity, the intellectual curiosity in the child to ask the question that has not been covered by the teacher. To ask about something which may not be in the textbook. We have a culture of respecting examinations in this country. And I blame teachers and parents equally for this because teachers often teach for the examinations and parents often judge children by how well they've done in the examination. So what marks have you brought back home in your report card? But you know, sometimes one loses sight of the fact that school is a preparation for a much bigger examination called life. And the examination of life has a nasty habit of asking you questions that weren't in the textbook you studied. And that examination called life requires you to apply yourself beyond what the teacher has told you in the classroom and what's in the textbook. It involves your being able to absorb information, unfamiliar information that you didn't prepare for, but that you have to absorb and synthesize and respond to in passing the examinations life throws up. I was struck that one of the students who got a prize today was praised for being a problem solver. He was one of the prefects. And I told him as I shook his hand, that's a great asset. People need problem solvers in life. The world needs problem solvers. And the truth is that when you come out of school, come out not only prepared to pass examinations, come out prepared to solve problems, including the problems you haven't prepared for. Because in many ways, the truly educated mind is the mind that has thought beyond what it has learned in the classroom. The true mark of education on your mind is what is left behind after you've forgotten everything you studied for the examinations. And that, to my mind, is something that a good school also instills in its students. Character, values, the moral compass, the problem-solving trait, self-reliance, an interest in activities going beyond the textbook and the examinations. I was so pleased to give a prize to a young man who, it was described by the announcer, had literary pursuits. And I, I asked him, so do you write stories? And he said, yes. And it brought me back to my own childhood when as an asthmatic child in an India before the advent of television, computers, handheld Nintendo games, and so on, when books were the only refuge for a child who was wheezing couldn't sleep and couldn't go out to play because of the asthma. That when I ran out of books, because I was the eldest child in the family, I read every one of my parents' books that I could understand. And whenever my parents took me to the library, I read so inconveniently fast, I finished the book in the car on the way home. I started writing because that was the only option available. There was no other distraction. And I was so fortunate that my parents encouraged that. Instead of dismissing these scribblings as the time pass of an ill child, which is at bottom what they were, 
My father got the stories typed up so I could share them with friends and pass them around. He made me feel that whatever little talent I was showing in my words was worth encouraging. And I urge parents here that the interests and passions of your children outside the classroom deserve as much encouragement as their accomplishments at Bishop Cotton's. I hope that when they come to school and they, they draw or they write or they paint or they run or they sing or they tell jokes in a way that amuse people or play the guitar or seek to do things that seem to you perhaps to show some spark of talent that others don't possess. Please encourage it, please nurture it, please let them feel that this is also worth doing and that you will not only judge them by the trophies they come home with and the first or second mark uh, in the examinations that they might have acquired. And I must say that um, the quality of the distinguished alumni Bishop Cottons suggests that the school gets most things right already and the parents and already young uh, Shiva Grover has already said all the right words about parents, which parents here deserve to hear. I hope that the parents will also do the right thing by their kids and encourage the other talents that perhaps the school has already helped give some initial expression to, but the parents will help flourish outside as well. At the same time, I want to go back to that initial reference to the help the Bishop Cottons gives the underprivileged. Because when you come out of a school with one of the best educations you can get in India, you are automatically joining an elite. An elite that is fortunate enough to be educated and to be educated well. But I hope that all of you, and I say this not just to the graduates, but to the ones who will continue from class 10 on to 11 and 12, I hope that you will remember your continuing responsibility to those outside whom you may encounter who haven't had the good fortune of getting into a school like Bishop Cotton's. I remember when I was in school an awfully long time ago now, five decades, we were always inspired by a slogan that came from Swami Vivekananda, each one teach one. And even as a young school student, I would try and go home and teach the domestic servants' children a few letters of the English language in the hope that it might serve them in good stead, or if they didn't know the Hindi language, that, that too was something I felt I could do. And the same applies to whatever other language your domestic helpers might have, or if not domestic helpers, people in your neighborhood whom you might come across who could benefit from that. If we could teach every child in India the alphabet, and if we could teach every old person in India who missed out on learning the alphabet when they were a child, think what a magical transformation that would bring about in our country. And every one of you here is equipped to do that. I still remember during my stint in the Human Resource Development Ministry going to a, a village adult resource center in Tamil Nadu. And I met a young woman who, I beg your pardon, a not very young woman, she was in her 50s, who uh, had been taught the alphabet quite recently and was very proud of it. And she pulled out her slate and she wrote her name in Tamil for me. And I was so pleased that this mattered so much to her. And I said, so what does being literate mean to you? How, does it, how has it changed your life? So you can write your name, but you know, somebody else could have written your name for you. What, what has changed in life? And she said something that I'll never, I'll never forget. She said, when I want to travel to the nearest town, which was Kanjibaram, I can go to the bus stop and I can read the names of the destinations on the buses myself. I don't have to ask somebody all the time, is that bus going to Kanjibaram? A very simple thing, but it's an illustration of the degree of empowerment that merely being able to decipher letters. A 50-year-old woman who have been unable to know which bus to get on, but the magic of literacy has given her that. If you children can go on and make your contribution to that to some people, it seems to me we will have a triumph and a satisfaction that I promise you few other things in your life will give you. 
The fact is that uh, we live in a country in which there is a great deal to be proud about, a great deal to be proud of, and a lot of things to be not so proud of. And the fact is that the question of what it is that we should be proud of is one that tends to bedevil us in India. Right now, we've just seen the unseemly controversy of the Indian Science Congress, where some people presented fanciful claims, suggesting that ancient India had aircraft thousands of years before the internal combustion engine was even invented. It was a scientific impossibility they were advancing. Or they claimed, a person in a very distinguished position of public office claimed, that the image of Lord Ganesha with his elephant head on a male on a human body proved that ancient Indians were masters of plastic surgery. Clearly he had never heard of the use of metaphor, but I'm sure that you kids have been taught that already in school. Now in debunking or criticizing such exaggerated claims, some of our Indians have gone to the opposite extreme. And they have in fact also criticized legitimate claims of actual accomplishments by the ancient Indians, which should in fact be matters of great pride for us. I don't know how many of you kids have had a chance to learn Roman numerals, but I'm sure you've realized that one of the great problems with Roman numerals is they do not have an ending. They just keep going on and on and on. They're useless for mathematical calculations. It was ancient India that invented that indispensable construct the zero. And with the zero, the entire world of mathematics was transformed. The Arabs learned numbers from us, the decimal system from us, from our forebears. And that's why the Western world who got them from the Arabs calls them Arabic numerals, but they really began in India. Al Khwarizmi, who wrote the initial textbooks that gave the world what is known as algebra, in his writings paid tribute to the unknown and unsung Indians who had invented these mathematical concepts. Indians invented the science of astronomy, not just astrology. I used to joke that uh, astrology is a real big science because an Indian without a horoscope is like an American without a credit card, you know, a terrible disability in life. But the truth is, the truth is that in fact in astronomy we were no slouches and Aryabhatta in the 5th century AD actually anticipated the discoveries of Copernicus, Kepler and indeed of Galileo who a thousand years after Aryabhatta was still being denounced as heretics for arguing propositions that Aryabhatta had precisely established. So the ancient Indians have done a great deal of things but rather than merely reveling in the accomplishments of the past, we need to ask ourselves, where have we lost that capacity? We can boast about the magnificent town planning of the Indus Valley, but we look at our unplanned, chaotic, overcrowded, dirty towns in, of, of, of India today, and there is no great satisfaction in telling ourselves that we had beautiful, clean, pristine, grid laid down cities with perfect sanitation systems 4,000 years ago, which we did, but if we lost the habit and the art of building that today, we have to worry about what we can do today. I'm, I'm, I'm not anxious to belabor the point. I do believe we should take pride in our past, but I believe it is more important to work to a present and a future that we and the next generation can be proud of. And that is where this wonderful symbolic ceremony of handing over the mantle of responsibility comes in. Because each graduation is in a sense a reminder that the responsibilities are being passed on, that the torch is being passed on to a new generation. The 17 and 18 and 16 year olds here already represent the Indian majority. Because a majority of India's population is closer to them in age than to their parents. The majority of India's population today is actually under 25. 65% of India's population is under 35. And if you look at just the age group between 10 and 19, and most of the kids here have 
belong to that cohort. If you just look at that age group, there are 225 million of them in India. And they represent both our greatest hope and our greatest challenge. Our greatest hope as a country because if they acquire the education and the training to seize the opportunities that the world of the 21st century can offer them, they can transform India, they can transform the world. They can be the agents of ensuring that India will finally fulfill the potential that we all know we're capable of. I don't want to only be able to boast that we were the USA of the third century BC, which we probably were. I want to be able to say that we are in no way inferior to the USA or the China or the Japan of the 21st century. And they can make that happen. But unfortunately, not everyone in that age group has had the opportunities and the education that Bishop Cottons has given these young people. We have a lot of young boys who have not gone to good schools and some who have gone to no school at all. And if we don't equip them with the skills, the basic literacy, the talents, the training to perform the jobs in the new growing economy we hope that India will move towards, if we don't do that, then the consequences for our country are dire because the Naxalites who have been conducting various kinds of insurrections in 165 of our country's 625 districts, those Naxalites are overwhelmingly composed of uneducated or undereducated, untrained, unemployed, frustrated young men who have no stake in our society or our economy because they can't participate in it and who therefore will pick up the gun because somebody is willing, some misguided people are willing to give them a thousand rupees and some food to wield a gun or a bomb to destroy this country rather than to give them the skills and the training to help build this country. And so we want a demographic dividend and not a demographic disaster. If we want the hopes that we are celebrating at the graduation today to not be a nightmare, we need to extend ourselves to those who've been left out of our system, of our education, out of our possibilities. Now, I don't want to speak only in terms of dire warning and concern because I'm basically an optimist. I have been accused of optimism. And it's an accusation that I quite happily endorse. In fact, uh, I have a book coming out called India Shastra, which talks about the India of today. But just seven years ago, I published a book called The Elephant, the Tiger, and the Cell Phone, which traces India's transformation from the lumbering elephant of old to the life, agile, sinewy tiger, the Asian tiger we always heard about. And you may ask, where does a cell phone come in? Well, to me, the cell phone was the embodiment of that transformation. And I'll tell you, kids, you've all grown up taking cell phones for granted. Maybe you have your own, maybe you have them at home because you're not allowed to bring them to school. I didn't check what the rules are at Bishop Cotton's. But I can tell you that when I was your age, a telephone was a very rare thing indeed. In the entire country of India, there were two million landline telephones at the time that I went off to graduate school in the US at the age of 19. To get a telephone was such a challenge. You had to be very important government official or businessman or doctor or journalist or somebody to actually get a telephone. And in many parts of India, if you got a telephone, you were very lucky. If you didn't, you would sit in a waiting list for many years. Then if you got a telephone, not everywhere did it actually work. Because I, my father was one of those lucky ones who had one of those two million telephones. But he was in Calcutta during my high school years. And every morning we had a ritual of going to the telephone sitting in the hall foyer to see if there was a dial tone that day. If there was a dial tone and we dialed a number, the odds were 9 out of 10 that we would get a wrong number rather than the number we dialed. Sometimes we'd stumble on somebody else's ongoing conversation. And they were unaware that we were listening to them because we had just got connected to them by accident. There was even a technical term for this. It was called a cross connection. These were connections that made us very cross. 
Then if you wanted to call another city, let's say from Calcutta you wanted to call Bangalore, you had to book a trunk call. And then you had to sit by the phone all day for the phone to ring. Because if the operator rang and you didn't answer immediately, they would skip you and go on to the next person in the queue. And a trunk call would take six or seven hours to come. Unless you paid eight times the going rate for something called a lightning call. But in those days in India, even lightning struck rather slowly. So a lightning call would take about half an hour rather than the six or seven hours of trunk calls. I mention all this because this was the state of communications. And when, as late as 1984, a member of parliament got up to criticize this woeful state of our national telephone system, the then communications minister replied in a lordly manner that telephones were a luxury in a developing country like India, not a right, that the government had no obligation to provide better service. And if the honorable member was not satisfied with his telephone, could he please return it since there was an eight year long waiting list for his telephone in Delhi? That was the kind of attitude we had. Now you fast forward to when I was writing this book in 2007. You know what happened? In that very month, in April of 2007 when I wrote my book, we actually set a new world record of selling more mobile telephones than the entire history of the world had ever seen in any one country in any one month. I think it was seven million mobile phones that year. So I wrote this fact very proudly and sent it off to my, um, to my publishers and the book went to press. But by the time it came out in December, this was already out of date because we'd broken our world record three times in those remaining months of December of 2007. And by December, we were selling 8.3 million mobile telephones a month. The following year, we crossed nine and then 10. The next year, it became 15. And for three months in 2010, India actually sold 20 million mobile phones a month. That is, in one month, we established 10 times more links than the entire country of India had had when I was leaving school, leaving college, and going off to graduate school. Now, that is the kind of transformation. But the transformation was not only one of numbers. Because the issue was, who had the old phones? People in high positions, important people, people of privilege. In fact, it was considered such a privilege that elected members of parliament had amongst their prerogatives the right to allocate 15 telephone connections to whomever they deemed worthy. But today, who's carrying one of these mobile phones? If you are being driven to and from the school, you know your driver has a mobile phone and he can afford to have it himself. In the suburbs of Delhi, where I now live, you will find in the side streets of the suburbs a man standing next to a wooden cart that looks like it was designed in the 16th century on which rests a coal-fired steam iron that looks like it was designed in the 18th century. That's the local Istriwala. But in his pocket, he carries a 21st century instrument a mobile phone. Because as you know, most incoming calls are free and it costs them nothing to get orders from all the apartments and houses in the neighborhood to come and pick up a shirt or a sari to iron. Fishermen in my constituency in Tiruvananthapuram in Kerala now carry mobile phones out to sea. The government gives them a GPS program that identifies the best places where the shoals of fish can be found. And when they've caught the fish and they come back near the coast, they call all the market towns along the coast so to see where they'll get the best price for the fish they've caught. I was actually in Tiruvananthapuram a couple of years ago in a, on a very hot day, and a friend of mine said, I was visiting his country farm, which is miles away from the city, and he said, uh, what would, you, would you like some coconut water to drink? It's a hot day, most refreshing thing you can have. So I said, yes, I want some coconut water. And he whipped out a mobile phone, dialed a number, and a voice said, I'm up here. And we looked up and right on top of the nearest coconut tree with his lungi tied around his knees, a hatchet in one hand and a mobile phone in the other was the local toddy tapper who brought down the coconuts for us to drink. Now, in other words, this is empowerment of the ordinary person. In the old days, a poor man, a migrant laborer in another town would have to go and dictate a letter to a professional letter writer in the village bazaar so his family back home could have news of him. Today he can actually telephone and hear his wife's or his father's or his mother's voice. 
Think of how much a simple instrument, a technological marvel of our times, has simply transformed our nation. And that's the kind of transformation I want to see across the world. If you're all users of Google, you know that you can Google the words frugal innovation, and you will find that the first 20 hits all relate to India. We are busy innovating, coming up with all sorts of products that are much more cheaper and affordable by the masses of our country, whether it's the cheapest in insulin injections in the world, the cheapest electrocardiogram machine in the world, the cheapest water filter in the world. All of these are Indian inventions, and there are more. But I would like us to go beyond just taking products that others have invented. And I'd like us to then invent things that no one else has thought of. That's the task that I hope this new generation will take on as their task. The task of out-of-the-box thinking. I said that we must go beyond what is taught in the classroom. In school, they teach you to answer the questions. In life, you will learn to question the answers. That thinking out of the box, which is, by the way, one of Steve Jobs' favorite phrases, that is so important. But one problem in our culture very often is that we repress creativity. We don't encourage people to challenge the conventional wisdom. And that is so important because it's not good enough for us in India to tell our young people, listen, this is the way something must be done. And when they say why, you say because it's always been done that way. That is simply not good enough. If you cannot explain convincingly to a young person why it's always been done that way, it seems to me you would be failing as an adult. And if the child only asks why, but never asks why not something else, that child is failing the duty of curiosity. Why can't things be reimagined? Why can't things be thought afresh? You know, I'll, I'll give you a simple example, since I know that some of you can see me on a screen and the kids here will have a bit of a challenge, but I'm wearing an example of out-of-the-box thinking. I need glasses for distance. I need, don't need glasses to look at the program of today's event or to see the first 10 rows of kids here. But if I actually had to recognize somebody at the back there, I couldn't, despite the bright light shining on you, because I'm, 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 I'm slightly short-sighted. So what do I do? I wear glasses. But because I don't often need to recognize people far away, I wear glasses barely 5% of the time. And as a result, I put them down, forget them, lose them. I put them in my lap when I take them off. I get up, they fall down, somebody steps on them, they break. I shove them away in a pocket, bang into a wall or a door or something, they break. There was a time, the first three months of 2013, when I actually ended up losing or breaking six pairs of glasses in three months. I was in despair and I said to a friend, this can't go on. So he said, what's the problem? And I said, glasses. For 150 years, glasses have always been made the same way. They sit on your nose, they join in the middle, they hang over your ears. And I find that personally very irritating. So once I've seen what I want to see at a distance, I take them off. I don't want these things on my ears. I don't want these things on my nose. So he said, yes, you're right. For 150 years, glasses have always been made one way. So let's see if there's some other way glasses can be made. And he came back a few weeks later with the answer to my problem. Now, when I, need to wear when I need to have glasses, they're always with me because they hang around my neck. But if I want to wear them and see somebody at a distance, they click into place with a magnet in the middle. So they don't have to be on my nose the whole time or around my ears the whole time. I can see you guys say hi to the back row, take them off, and carry on speaking to the rest of you. Now, that, to my mind, is the kind of creative thinking we need to see more and more and more of in India. And I hope that we will actually encourage that in our schools, in our homes, and in our lives. I, I don't want to, to keep going on. Uh, I had really hoped to be uh, relatively brief. You know, I tend to, um, I tend to be a, a follower. The parents will get this joke. The kids won't. I tend to be a follower of the Elizabeth Taylor School of Public Speaking. As Elizabeth Taylor said to her husband's, I shall not keep you long. You know, that, that, that was my, 
my preferred modus, but I'm afraid today I have gone on a bit longer than I intended to. I think I was carried away by the splendor of this occasion, but just to reinforce that point about creative thinking, uh, you should know that, um, that the mind is very much like a parachute. It works best when it's open. Don't try to use a closed parachute and don't try to go through life with a closed mind. It's extremely important to keep learning every day of your life, whatever age you are. And I can say with pride, I'm two months shy of turning 59 and I don't think I've lived a single day that I haven't learned something new. And I think that's the, the only spirit in which you should lead life because that potential for learning is something that God has endowed us with that all of us can take forward to improve our opportunities as well as the world around us. I don't want to give you too many homilies. I'm sure you've heard many as graduates. One has to give you some advice. And the first advice I want to say is develop your talents, whatever they are. As I said earlier, it may not be a talent to win prizes or come first in the race or play the guitar like uh, the best musician you've ever heard. It may simply be a talent to make people laugh, to make people happy, to show concern for others. But every one of us has a talent that others will appreciate if only we let it flourish and let it manage. And at the same time, the most important yardstick is not whether you came better than the other student in your class. The most important yardstick is whether you did the best that you are capable of doing. And believe me, you know that. You know that at the end of the day, that if you've done your best and you haven't triumphed, there is no shame in that. The attempt, the effort, the dedication, that's what really matters. And if you've tried to do the best that you can, then you haven't let yourself down. And in life, ultimately, it's the most important message I can give you. Don't let yourself down. Because no one, no one can be a better you than you can be. Be the best you that you can be, and everything else will follow. So my young graduates today, you are going out into an India full of opportunities, an exciting India, an India that's in the process of major transformation. But as I said, the opportunities are matched by the challenges and it becomes very important, very, very important it seems to me that all of you work hard to merit the prizes that some of you have won. Sometimes, you know, there are comments of, gosh, he was lucky. And the best reply to that was given by somebody who once said, somehow the harder I work, the luckier I get because luck comes to those who, who work. So work hard, pursue your talents, give it the scope that you know you can. Be the best you that you can be. Take risks, by the way, because this is the age at which you can afford to take risks. Never be afraid of failure. And I say that not because I'm encouraging you to idle and not take the exams, no, not that kind of failure. I mean aspiring to something that you might not be able to pull off and succeed at. Because the fact is that all of us have had to go through setbacks in life. There is no successful person on this planet who has not had some setback at some stage of their lives. They are where they are because they have learned from those successes. They have written above those successes. They have sometimes been tempered by fire. I sometimes say that since my return to India, or more appropriately, my entry into Indian politics, I've suffered a number of Agni Parikshas myself. But those Agni Parikshas, those trials by fire, at the end, they can burn you to ashes or they can temper you like steel that has been through fire. And that is ultimately what you need to do. If you fall, tell yourself you're capable of rising again. The waves do it all the time. They rise and fall all the time. Those of you who followed the cricket match today know that a ball that bounces up can also come down. But once it comes down, it can bounce up again if you put the right amount of effort behind it. 
So what matters is not whether you fall. What matters is your determination to rise again. What matters is not the fire, but your courage to face the fire. What matters, and I say this to all of you, is your faith in yourself, in whatever version of the divine you believe in, or not, as the case may be, and if not, then at least in the truth, because the truth ultimately is what we all aspire to live up to, and it's the truth that sets us free. And if we can do all of that, if we can be all of that, then we will have been worthy of the grounding we have had in a good school, the love and support we have had from our parents, and the faith instilled in us through our education and our moral values, the faith with which we can go forth into the world, knowing that we are determined to leave the world a slightly better place for us having been in it. Go forth, my young graduates of, of Bishop Cotton's, my Cottonians. Thank you, Principal Zachary, for the opportunity to uh, address these young boys and their parents. And thank you again for all of you to, uh, for listening to me so patiently. I want to congratulate you not only for having graduated from Bishop Cotton's, I want to con congratulate you in advance for the contribution that I know you're going to make to our country's future. India needs you. Be proud of what you've accomplished so far, but don't rest on your laurels. Be determined to accomplish more. Be optimistic and enthusiastic about what you will accomplish. And go out knowing that all the proud adults here watching you and applauding you will want to be even prouder of what you go on to do once you've graduated from this school. India and the world await you. Do your best. Make it a better place. Congratulations. Thank you. And Jai Hind. The graduating class were all highly excited and in eager anticipation to listen to your valedictory speech. And you, sir, have not disappointed them with your words of inspiration. Thank you for the reminder that failure is the stepping stone to success. I'm sure the class of 2015 will bear in mind that problem solving is what will help one forge through life. I'm sure that each inspired Cotonian will definitely give back to society. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bishop Gordon Boys School is